So the title, I'd like to at least give you the, give the title before I uh, hand it over. So it's Virtuous and Vicious Anger, What Aristotle Has to, uh, to, to Teach Us, uh, or to Offer Us, it's Teach Us. Uh, so, and Greg Sadler, so let's uh, give him a big green mountain welcome. Thanks. So um, you might ask, well, why, why Aristotle? You know, is it just this guy has a thing for, for Aristotle, so we found some way to work it in. You know, those of you who are in the ethics class, you are you know, doing some virtue ethics in Aristotle. Um, but the connection to, say, environmental ethics is not one that's immediately obvious. Um, I'm interested in Aristotle on, on anger in part because if you look at the history of philosophy, and that would include, you know, philosophy sort of writ large, so it would include some theological thinkers, some people we now associate with psychology. When you look at the way that they treat anger, um, there are a few consistent trends that you can see. Most philosophers see anger as a uniformly bad thing. So Cicero will say, for example, anger, never good. John Cassian, uh, a Christian monastic writer who wrote about the Desert Fathers, the only time it's good to be angry is when you're angry at yourself and only angry at your, your own vices. Um, Plato is a little bit, you know, all over the map when it comes to it because he didn't have a theory of anger, um, but he, he tends to see it as a, a dangerous thing. He tends to see the emotions as, as fairly dangerous. The Stoics, definitely, anger is a bad thing. The Epicureans, bad thing. Most of the, the Christian writers, until we get to people like Aquinas, it's almost uniformly bad. In modern philosophy, um, the tendency tends to be to turn anger just into one more emotions like, like the others and um, treat it accordingly. But sometimes you find people who still say it's uniformly bad, like Jeremy Bentham, for example, um, somebody who you might encounter when you're doing utilitarianism. More likely you're reading Mill, though, right? We're talking about both. Okay, well, there you go. Bentham thought that uh, anger is always a sign of what he calls the, the motive of malevolence. That's so always bad. Aristotle thinks, and here he's rather unusual, that anger can be a good thing. And we also live in a society that's rather schizophrenic when it comes to anger. You know, we see glorifications of angry behavior in, in media, but we're told quite often, and you'll be told a lot more as you, you know, proceed through all the sorts of landmarks of adult life, that anger is just, you know, it's not the right thing to do. So... Aristotle is an interesting guy to look at because he provides us with some sort of way of seeing anger in some cases, and I want to really stress that, in some cases, as a positive thing. So he also gives us a really sophisticated understanding about how anger works, and that's something that's important for figuring out whether it can be a good thing. He gives us an analysis of anger as, as an emotional response in terms of habits, in terms of action, in terms of attitudes. And one of the handouts that I've given you, I've given you a lot of handouts, and I don't expect you to like, you know, peruse them all right now. They're for, for reference. But one of them is about Aristotelian texts that actually treat dimensions of anger. And you notice that there are a lot of different spots in Aristotle where he's examining the emotion or, the, you know, the morality or the responsibility our reasoning processes, dealing with anger. And as I've been doing the research for the book, I've distinguished between a lot of different dimensions of, of anger that Aristotle discusses. And I'm not going to go through all six of them here, but let me just distinguish three of them. We can look at anger as what we call a somatic response. Soma is the body. Um, what happens when you get angry? What happens to you? I know, like, my ears turn red because I've had students tell me that. Um, I had students who actually, I used to teach in a maximum security prison, and I would have students who would deliberately try to get me angry in class because they like to see me get angry. Uh, weird that they'd want to do that, but, you know. What happens to you when you get angry, physically? Yeah. Oh, that's bad, yeah. That, that's not really bad for your jaw and teeth, but... Common response, yeah. Yeah, that, that's more on the, the level of the emotions. Um, but, if, you know, there's some physical basis for that we're thinking, yeah. Um, somebody else had their hand up. 
Yeah. Uh, you know, Aristotle actually, he was, you know, he was working with natural science in a time when they hadn't developed it very well. He calls anger a boiling of the blood near the heart, if we want to talk about it physically. Yeah. Um, like heart rate increases. Yeah. Get, I, I don't get angry very often, so That's I good. get like an adrenaline rush. I get that too. I would actually get the shakes from all the adrenaline flowing through my system. Um, I don't. Ah, that, that happens too. Do you get like, does your body get rigid too? Hence, any of you? Yeah. Yeah, that's why anger can sometimes give you headaches because your neck gets all tense. Yeah. Flushing, yeah. So these are all somatic responses. And, you know, you could go further with this. You could do MRIs of angry people. Those are a little bit limited in, in how much they can actually tell us because you've got to put somebody in the machine and try to provoke them. It's a little bit artificial, right? But um, it tells us something. And Aristotle thinks that that matters, but that matters less than what we might call the phenomenological uh, way in which we experience anger. What is it like to actually get angry? The tunnel vision is kind of part of that. The irrationality. The, like focusing in on you know a few things and not letting them go that's characteristic of anger if you read anger management textbooks they'll tell you the first thing you need to know about anger is once you get angry you become dumb you become stupid no matter how intelligent you are because that's part of the, the dynamic of the emotion of anger and Aristotle is going to tell us about what anger actually consists in emotion and he's pretty good when it comes to that then we can look at anger on a yet higher level in terms of ethics. Is it right or wrong to get angry? Are we responsible for our anger? Those are ethical questions. Those are not questions that you can answer just by looking at the body or just by looking at how the emotions work. You have to look at choices people make, habits, uh, the criteria that they use. So that's all, you know, sort of background information to get us, get us sort of prepped for this. Let's talk now about virtue ethics. So you had a, a brief introduction to it before, and I have a handout again. I have handouts for each, you know, part of what we're going to do today. The handout for you on, on that. Um, I also have an exercise that I'm not going to have you do in class today, but it's the one about character traits, and I, I'd like you to complete it and bring it to uh, Dr. Festmeyer's class as sort of um, homework, uh, and I'll I'll give him some ideas about you know how to. Parse it. I'm sure he's got some good ideas already. But you notice that character traits do matter to us when it comes to ethics. Ethics is not just about rules. It's not just about duties. It's not just about outcomes. As human beings, we're interested in what kind of people are we and what are the traits of a good person. We can try to get away from that, but it, it always, there's an old expression about nature that the ancients had. You can, you know, throw nature out with a pitchfork, but it will always come back through, through the back door. The same thing will happen with character traits. If you, if you go further in reading Bentham or go further in reading Kant, you're going to find that they're going to have to talk about that sort of thing uh, and make sense of it. Mill is, as well. So virtue ethics, um, why is it called virtue ethics? Well, we look at things called virtues and vices, and we look at those as our main evaluative criteria. Um, Oftentimes, we'll contrast it against other approaches. I'm not sure, have you done that in, in the class? Have you like done some compare, contrast? Like, how would, okay, so, you know, some of the comparisons we could make would be between, would be between sort of consequentialist, the big family of, of consequentialist ethics, um, most, you know, represented by, by utilitarianism and current policy debates and things, things like that. But, you know, egoist consequentialism would fit in over there. And then we have what often we call deontological or duty-based ethics or non-consequentialist ethics. And then, you know, where does virtue ethics fit in? Well, it doesn't. It's a third thing. It's, it's a distinctive approach that has some elements of both of those that can take into account what's good in those, but, but goes beyond them. Um, there's some other interesting things that have been going on in ethics recently. Have you guys talked about ethics of care at all in your class? We mentioned it. Uh, I 
maybe it was the last class, yeah. uh, talking briefly about feminist ethics and a different approach than the one that we were talking about. When you guys remember, we were talking about Singer and Regan and utilitarianism and Kantian deontological yeah. thought. And so well, there's this other view that says that emotions and actually caring about something is morally relevant or morally important and not to be sunk. Yeah. Uh, and so we talked about it last class period. But that was so, all we said. Yeah. So that would be another, another you know, polarity to, to ethics. And there's a lot of conjunctions between what a lot of ethics of care people don't realize. The better ones do. Uh, but a lot of them don't realize exists between ethics of care and virtue ethics. Because when they're doing their work very well, they're actually doing something very similar to classic virtue ethics. The, the, the emotions matter for Aristotle just as much as they do for Virginia Health um, or uh, Carol Gilligan, pick whoever you like, Michael Sloat. Um, so where, where ethics of care probably goes further is in emphasizing the importance of relationships. The fact that the self is not, you know, an atom, uh, the way it's often been represented. But you can also get that out of virtue ethics as well. Um, I want to make a distinction here, too, between two different ways of seeing virtue ethics in relation to these other moral theories. So I've contrasted virtue ethics to a bunch of moral theories. You could say, well, virtue ethics is, is you know, just a separate thing. It's got its own criteria for utilitarianism. What's the criteria? Does anyone remember right offhand? You guys get a little formula? Greatest? Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Greatest happiness principle, you know, maximize pleasure, minimize pain across the board. Um, what if you're um, a Kantian? There's a, a special principle that memorize. Yeah, there you go. And it's got several formulations. They get a little tricky when you actually go to apply them. And there actually seems to be a little consequentialism mixed in there, but according to Kant, they're, you know, it's pure. Um, so that would be true. They used to do Kant uh, in London. So okay. Yeah. So you get two different criteria there, right? Uh, ethics of care, what would be the caring thing? What would be the empathetic thing? That might be one of the criteria. Virtue ethics, well, what, would be, what would be the virtuous thing? How would a virtuous person? Now, we're treating each of these as excluding the others, as exclusionary. That's not the way ethics really works. When you guys come out of this class and you put together some sort of way of meandering through your life and threading the many very tight needles of moral decision-making that you're faced with, you're not going to like whip out you know, some laminated card with a categorical imperative on it and say, well, I'm a conscience, so I, just, I only go by this. No utilitarianism for me. Um, there are conscients who take that into account. There are virtue ethics, virtue ethicists who can say outcomes matter, you know, duties matter, rules do matter. But we need to we need to integrate them into a, a, a better way of looking at things, into a more comprehensive system. So that's the kind of virtue ethics that Aristotle offers us that we're, we're looking at today. Um, I do want to say um, two other things about about virtue ethics as well. Well, actually, three other things particularly since this is an environmental ethics class. Um, so one, one thing that goes wrong with virtue ethics, people will sometimes think that, well, you just provide a list of virtues and say, you know, you could make a poster. You see this in a lot of workplaces, right? Courage, perseverance. Maybe you have some pictures, you know, like a little cat hanging on the... That's perseverance, right? A cat, you know, ready to scratch. That's courage. And I don't know what you do for justice. Cat sharing a you know cat food with another cat perhaps fairly equitably, um, they start to break down. That's not yet doing virtue ethics. That's just naming virtues. In order to actually be doing virtue ethics, this is the second thing I want to say. We need to actually be thinking about what is a virtue. It's not enough just to name them or to you know create pictures, however compelling they may be. We have to actually have some account of what justice is or what prudence is, or what empathy, if that's going to be a virtue, is. Um, we have to do some, some thinking about this. The, the third thing I want to say about this, and then we're going to look at Aristotle's virtue ethics. Um, because most of the, the major theorists who were associated with virtue ethics tend to be ancient, medieval, early modern thinkers, 
it's often seen as something necessarily conservative, um, necessarily you know, stuck in the past, not, not radical, not reactionary, not, actually reactionary, not radical, um, not liberating, any, any of those sorts of things. Not engaged in cultural criticism. If you actually look at Plato or you look at Aristotle, you will see them intensely critical of their own cultures. Aristotle says not a single one of the currently existing Greek regimes, and he, he you know, wrote books on over 100 of them, has good laws. Not a single one of them. Here's how they could be improved. These guys were social reformers. There's certain respects, like we were talking uh, before class, Aristotle, you know, Aristotle thought that, that slavery could, in fact, in certain circumstances, be a good thing. He did, in fact, get used by southern slaveholders uh, to provide justifications. They really had to twist the text just as much as they did with the Bible in order to make that happen, but, but it, it did happen. Uh, he's got some blind spots. But virtue ethics as an approach, there's nothing to necessarily tie it in with some sort of conformism or you know, lack of cultural critique. One of the most important virtue ethicists around today, Alistair McIntyre, uh, is in fact what we call a revolutionary Aristotelian. He's, if you go to the, the McIntyre conferences, you'll see a mix of Aristotelians and Thomists, and then you know, people like me who are not affiliated, and Marxists. McIntyre was a Marxist, and he brought all that forward. So virtue ethics can actually provide us with a really solid way of critiquing our current institutions, our current practices, uh, our current culture, to say what people are calling courage today actually isn't courage. Here's what real courage would look like. Um, or, you know, justice or, or self-indulgence versus temperance. So it's a really useful um, point, I think. Um, one of the things I wanted you to to look at in this was, I've got this handout, it's a very long handout, it's like three pages. Afterwards, take a look at it. It's got, you know, Aristotle's position on virtue and vice sort of broken down into schemas that'll be very helpful for you. I'm going to give you just the bullet points of it. When Aristotle talks about a virtue or a vice, as opposed to some other thinkers who use those terms, he means what we call a habit. Settled disposition. So, for example, how many of you would describe yourself um, as a generous person? Okay. Can you be relied upon in most circumstances, not necessarily all, to, to act generously? No? Then you're not a generous person, according to Aristotle. If you can't be relied upon, good to be honest, though. I mean, when I ask about honesty, how many of you are, then you get to raise your hand for that one, right? Because you're actually copying to something. Um, how many of you leave good tips? Um, what else goes into generosity? How many of you are willing to loan a book to a friend, even though you may not get, even though you probably, whenever you loan books, you're probably not going to get that book back? What else might go into generosity? How many of you would give of your time even though you've got some sort of obligation uh, because you have a friend who can't change a tire, and you can. Let's assume you could change a tire, those of you who can. See, these are the sort of things that go into generosity, and those are actions. It's the matrix of those actions, the habit, that is a virtue. Um, what might be the opposite of generosity? Being greedy, okay. Uh, being stingy, selfishness, okay. What does that look like in a person? If somebody really is selfish, they don't just do a selfish action. You can rely on them to be selfish whenever presented with the opportunity. So what's a selfish person like at a party? What are the sort of things they might do? They wouldn't bring any. But they would take it. They'll eat all the food. They'll they'll drink, you know, whatever's available. Or they'll drink the best stuff too, you know, um, the high end stuff. They'll break into the cabinet. And, um, what else might they do? What's that? Make a mess? Not don't worry about cleaning it up. Now, the kind of person who does that characteristically, we would say that person has a vice. Aristotle would call that a, a vice. Um, 
And he actually, we're not going to talk about that vice here, but he talks about that in, in his, his ethics. So these are dispositions, and they're dispositions that have to do with behavior. Yeah? Um, just to go back to virtue and how it has to be a habit, isn't that going to be can we say that it's social virtue and not subjective? Because it really would depend on what people value and how often they do it, and what might be generosity to you might not be ah. generosity to me. So. Yeah, so there's subjective and then there's subjective. Um, there's nothing that you're going to find in human behavior that is purely 100% objective in that it has no participation of human subjectivity within it. But there's, there's bad subjectivity, like it's totally arbitrary, it's all over the map. And then, you know, there is a, there's good subjectivity, as Paul Ricoeur calls it. Um, Aristotle thinks that we can actually come up with criteria for what counts as generosity. He thinks that some people are actually wrong about what counts as generosity, and some people are, are closer to what's right. One of the interesting things about virtue ethics is it can explain to us why that is. People who are screwed up tend to have screwed up moral perceptions. So if I'm a stingy person, Aristotle says, if I'm a vicious person in general, I don't realize I'm vicious usually. I think I'm the norm. And everybody else is screwed up. Now, you know, there, there is some, some sort of, you know, looseness or play in there. But we can, we can approximate to um, characteristics that we can say, well, in most cases is what most reasonable people would call generosity. If, if generosity is going to mean something like I give everything I've got all the time, uh, you know, in a pathological way, where it's totally damaging to me and my family. There are some people who think that's what generosity is. Aristotle would say, well, they're, they're not the standard. Um, who, who is the standard? Virtuous people. We look to the ones who actually exhibit those qualities and do it reliably for our standard of how to, to behave. Now, it doesn't mean we couldn't be wrong about it. Aristotle, <laughs> um, one of the ones that he um, seems to have gotten quite wrong is... Um, what he calls great souledness, uh, magnanimity, which is this kind of pride, uh, uh, pride in oneself. And later authors came and said, yeah, he, he, that one, he, he's great about the justice, he's great about the courage, that one, um, he's really encouraging a kind of uh, bad behavior. Um, so, you know, there, there's a sort of cultural growth in this as well. There's other virtues that I think Aristotle could have talked about, but you know, if he was in our time, he would have, like, say, empathy. Doesn't talk about it. Um, so there, you know, there's, there's, we can sort of approximate along and, and get it to to a better position. That's a good, important question, though. So um, going back to Aristotle, you guys have talked about the mean, right? Mean means the middle. And it's not just, you know, there's a vice over here and a vice over here, and I try to aim for the middle, like I'm going, you know, driving a boat through buoys or something to get to the marina. Um, it's rather about proportion. So what would be the generous, let me, let me go back to tips again and generosity. What's a generous tip? What do you guys leave? What do you feel good about leaving if you had good service? What percent? Okay, so that's a good guideline. Yeah, go ahead. Over 20%? If you're in the service industry, it's probably 30%. Uh, because you, you actually have a much greater appreciation of what it's like to get, you know, get tips and get shafted on tips and you know, have good tips and bad tips and all that sort of thing. But 20% is good. I'm from the Midwest, and it took me a while to acclimate to this because at least where I grew up, you know what good service gets? 15%. And okay service... 10%. You know what bad service gets in Wisconsin? Penny. A penny left on the table in full view to say, this was not good. This is all I'm leaving for you. <laughs> um, now, I had to, I had to acclimate. Uh, my, my wife was very instrumental in that um, because you know, she's, she works at, at the culinary, so she knows a lot of people in the service industry. And she's a more generous person than I am. And so over time, I look at generous people and I sort of try to align my, my own behavior with them, and I even go against my own instincts in doing so. That took a lot of doing to get me to leave more than 15%. Believe it, you know, it may sound kind of silly, but yeah. Can generosity be self-serving? Well, then it wouldn't be generosity. 
that's that's a that's a um, where we get to like you know the why of what, what what's going on. But does the why matter? Oh, absolutely. In virtue ethics, the why matters. Um, for Aristotle, it's not just being in the middle. It's doing the right thing for the right reason, at the right time, with the right people. If, if being generous, you know, means like just throwing dollar bills around, you know, make it rain, uh, that sort of thing, um, that might be giving money to the wrong people. Real generosity, like, looks to who you're actually helping out. Real courage doesn't mean, like, getting in fistfights, you know, to protect everybody. Maybe some people can stick up for themselves, and you don't need to get involved in those. Yeah. Yeah, then you have fake generosity. Then you have fake generosity. No, I mean, it's better than not being generous. I mean, here's the thing. It's better than... than it's better to behave, to fake it till you make it, even if you never make it. It's better to do that for good things than to not do anything, right? But it's, it's yet better to actually have the right motivations, to have the right, um, as Aristotle says, the, the person who actually has virtue takes pleasure in, in acting virtuously. If I have to, if I want to look generous, and I'm, I'm doing it even though like every time it's killing me inside, <laughs> I'm dying a little bit, then I'm what he would call the, the self-controlled person. I'm not the virtuous person. And that's a good thing. That's better than being uncontrolled, better than being vicious, but it's not yet being virtuous, yeah. So if the virtuous person takes pleasure in acting virtuously, yeah. are they not acting virtuously only to receive that? No, Aristotle, Aristotle talks about that. Um, if that were the case, then he'd just be a hedonist, like Epicurus or Aristippus. He says that pleasure is something that comes to them through doing it, they want to do what is actually the right action, and they enjoy doing the right action as, as a result. It's not, if they're only doing it to try to get pleasure out of it, it's a dumb way to try to get pleasure, because there's a lot better ways to get pleasure. You know? For other people, but well, for a virtuous person, it could be the no, best way to get pleasure. The virtuous person is going to be well integrated. So they're going to have a lot of different ways they can get pleasure. And some ways are available to everybody, you know. Um, you want to get drunk, you just drink some, some alcohol. Anybody can do that. And that's enjoyable until, you know, later on, you drink too much of it. Um, you know, Aristotle thinks that if, if you're only doing it to get kicks out of it, you're not yet virtuous. You're virtuous when it's become part of who you are. Um, and, you know, if you ask people who, who are high performers in, in certain fields who actually do really well, you say, you do it because, you, you know, just for the pleasure, the enjoyment, they'll say, no, that comes as a result of it. Um, I enjoy it, and then you can use that as a sign of whether the person has, has acquired that, that virtue. But they're not doing it just for the pleasure. Likewise, you know, doing the wrong thing would be painful for them. But they're not, not doing the wrong thing just to avoid pain. Because um, then that wouldn't be that wouldn't be virtuous. The vicious person, by the way, has the has the opposite thing. The vicious person enjoys doing the wrong thing. That's why you know it's so hard for them to stop doing the wrong thing. They think it's the right thing and they enjoy it. And they also enjoy other people doing it. Um, but let's let's go on. Uh, these are these are important uh, questions and, and distinctions. So. Um, we want to develop an adequate understanding about what each of these virtues and vices are. So sometimes that's actually going to mean developing new vocabulary. Aristotle actually says, we don't have a name for this virtue. I'm going to make up a name. Um, like, for example, right ambition. He says, we don't have, we have, you know, being ambitious and being unambitious. What's the right amount? You know, how much drive do you have? How, what are you willing to do? Um, in order to attain position, attain honor, prestige, further yourself, all those sorts of things. There's actually a right position in the middle for that. But he says, so rare, at least in his society, which was honor-obsessed, that we don't have a name for it yet. So I'll just call it right ambition. Now, we, we have stuff like that, but perhaps there's dispositions in our current culture 
where we don't yet have the moral vocabulary and we would want to develop them. Anger is not one of them. So we, we've been thinking about that for a long time. Uh, I'm gonna actually going to skip. I was going to have you do a, a, an exercise, but I'm actually going to skip over it uh, just in order to save on, on time. Um, I, I have a handout about, um, this one's pretty dense as well, Aristotle's uh, analysis of the nature and the causes of anger. Why are we looking at, at this? We're looking to try to understand anger as an emotional response. What happens when we get angry? Why, why do people get angry? If we can get a good handle on that, then we can have a, a really good sense of when it could be good, when it could be bad. So one of the things you're going to notice, he has a very complex definition of anger, a working definition. I don't want to say this is like the be-all, end-all definition, because he gives several different definitions. This one is coming from a book called The Art of Rhetoric, which um, if you're going to go to law school, you'll probably read. If you're going to go into rec comp, you'll probably read as well, uh, because it tells you, you know, how to persuade people, how to make an argument, how to make a case. And he thinks that it's important to understand the emotions so that you can recognize when people are feeling them, when uh, you want to cultivate them, how to steer them, and how to calm you know, emotions like anger in, in your audience. Um, he also has advice, too, which is a little bit uh, not quite so good, about how to steer anger from one person against, you know, anger against one person to another person, your opponent in, in debate. Not, not quite so nice there, but um, the rhetoric is designed to be sort of a handbook for people who are going to be involved in making cases. So he says it's a desire. When you're angry, there's something you want. It's not just that your blood is boiling or your face is turning red. You want something. What is it that you want? He says, uh, for apparent retribution. Timoresis. Timoresis means sort of setting things right. Restoring what was damaged. Fixing things. Uh, and he's got this word apparent, I translated it as apparent there. It could also be translated as public. It could be translated as even imaginary, this, uh, you know, fantasia, um, or phenomenes in Greek. Um, so that's what it wants. It wants apparent retribution. Why? Well, it's produced by what we call a slighting. A slighting is when you're, you're, you know, we often talk about people being one up and one down. Are you guys familiar with this sort of terminology? I, you know, I, I, I insult you or I bully you so that I'm above you in some way. I just, you know, make a crack. Nice shirt. You know, I'm trying to actually, like, you know, put myself up higher and you lower. That's what a slighting is. Um, leaving that one penny as the tip. Real slighting. Saying, your service is terrible or at least it was today. Um, so an apparent sliding. Now notice the role of the apparent there. In order to make somebody mad, do you actually have to do something bad to them? Well, let's be honest about ourselves. In order for us to get mad, does somebody actually have to do something that's actually bad to us? Or is it possible for us to get mad in all sorts of other cases? I got mad today because I, I missed a turn. Stupid, you know? Um, and I was, I was thinking about, can this fit Aristotle's definition, you know? Um, who am I mad at? The people who designed the road? The people who put the signs? I just wasn't paying attention. And so, you know, we're, we're 90 and 87 split. I wasn't paying attention. I just, you know, mindlessly drove on to 90 and I had to make a little detour. And, you know, I've, I've actually, one reason why I'm interested in anger is I've been a very angry person in my life. And thankfully, I, I've gotten better with that. And with this in the past, I would have been furious. Those stupid road designers. Now, did they actually try to screw me by putting the roads where they were, the signs? Were? No. And whose fault actually was it? It was my fault because I wasn't paying attention. But you notice that you can have that anger response. I, I, I know that intersection well. <laughs> I think it's the road designers. They, they really are just as bad as the now you, now you just, you know, sort of... You know what I'm talking about, right? Oh, yeah. Do you guys think it's a bad design? I mean, it's not like they... It's not like some states where the signage is actually wrong, you know? Um, 
What? Well, New York. When you get into the city, some of the signage is actually incorrect. You know, there's also in some of the, the um, towns around us, people enjoy turning the street signs 90 degrees. You know, so you don't know what street you're on. Thank God for GPS because you know, I'd get lost pretty easily. Um, they're, they're actually doing something kind of malicious, aren't they? You could get angry about that. But it's not like they said, I am going to get this guy. You know? So the appearance, the, 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 the um, imaginary function of it is important. Um, sliding against who? Against oneself. We get angry when people do wrong to us. We also get angry, Aristotle says, when people do wrong to those who are connected with us. Now, who might that be? Who's connected with you? Who do you get angry when people do something to that person? Yeah. Yeah, family and friends. Those are, those are the roots. Would you guys get angry if somebody did something to, let's say somebody's got a uh, Green Mountain College shirt on, and uh, you guys don't have enough of a town to have, like, you know, townie versus um, uh, college student conflicts like, like some places do. Well, let's say you had that sort of thing. And so you see somebody getting pushed around. They're wearing a Green Mountain sweatshirt. They're a freshman. You don't know them. They just showed up on, on campus. Would you get mad? I, I, I probably would. And I, you know, if it was somebody from one of my schools. Um, now, how are they connected to you? Okay, they're part of your community. Yeah, what were you going to say? That's the key term. We identify with, with other people. The fact that we are beings in relationship makes our ability to get angry much wider than that of the other animals. I mean, you know, animals will get angry when you do what to them. Dogs pull their tail. Um, you learn really early on, your parents say, don't pull the dog's tail. You go and you pull the dog's tail because you want to find out what will happen. And then you find out you're going to get bit. And the dog will snarl at you, right? They don't like that. Uh, you ever, any of you ever try to take a dog's food away? I did it once. And my loving dog, she turned on me and hit up my face. And, you know, that's an anger response. Um, now, a dog might get upset if it, you know, you're going after its puppies or if it's formed a strong bond with a human being or another dog or even cats that it's looking after. But a dog is not going to see some other dog over there, you know, who's the same breed as it, getting kicked by somebody and say, I need to go over there and mess with them because I'm mad. That doesn't happen. Uh, you know, insects kind of seem like they're getting angry, but we don't even know what, what's going on in their little brains. Um, you know, like you, you kill a yellow jacket, the other yellow jackets will come and sting you. Turns out that's, that's just pheromones. It's not an anger response at all. But we can get angry about all sorts of stuff because we can identify with all sorts of people. Um, do any of you ever get angry on, on social media? Yeah? All the time. Why? Oh, I mean, because people are saying things that either don't make sense or aren't backed up correctly or just playing wrong. Yeah. They, you know, why does that bother us so much? I mean, people are, in general, not you know, a very bright species. And we do a lot of dumb stuff. I mean, I, I know I've done a lot of dumb stuff myself. I'm still doing dumb stuff occasionally. 44, I should know better. Um, why does that bother us so much? I mean, we, we can all relate to that, right, I think? Getting on social media. You ever, like, read down in comment sections? Yeah. Facebook is one thing, but comment sections? Wow, if you want to find some fodder for fueling your anger, great place to go. Yeah. I was going to say, our response to people being stupid is like a trigger response because we don't like ourselves we're stupid. So seeing it in other people, like, triggers that response that we feel for ourselves and then it fires us. That's an interesting theory. I don't know that that, that applies that widely. Um, it be, be interesting to try to pan that out as an explanation for things. I think in a lot of cases, it's more like that's a stupid thing they're saying, and I don't, it's not a, reflecting on, on you know, me as being stupid. I just think they're wrong, and why the hell did they post it there in the first place? They have no right to do that, and they're probably you know, denigrating somebody who I actually like, and you know, it just goes on and on. From there, you guys are kind of familiar with how this works, right? So these are all components of it. He also talks about pain and pleasure being involved in anger. The pain is caused by all of this. The pleasure is actually in taking or imagining 
retribution. And if we're honest with ourselves, I think that we can see that, that that's part of what goes on. Aristotle talks about um, three main categories of what he's calling sliding. And does this cover everything? I don't think so. Um, when he gets to some of the dynamics, he has some other things that, that fit in there as well. But these, are, these do cover a lot of ground. Contempt, what he calls kataphronesis. In, in Greek, kataphronesis is like looking down on somebody else. So if, if I come in here and I treat you like you're, you, you guys know nothing, I'm just here to fill you all with my wonderful knowledge, how many of you would, would get irritated? Only, only half of you? The rest of you are like, yeah, I'm, I'm, that's fine. I, that's exactly what I expect in a college professor. <laughs> I know I'd get irritated if I was in the audience. I sometimes walk out of people's papers if I don't, if I don't think they're any good. Um, not, not as much these days, thank God. But well, Cataphronesis. Um, there's a lot of ways to do this. Saying snide things about somebody. Um, Doing actions that show that you don't value them. Here's a great example. How many of you, I don't know if, if you guys have this dynamic here, but my students at other colleges hate doing group assignments. You guys hate do, doing group? Why? Why don't you like doing group assignments? Yeah, one person usually ends up doing most of the work, and the other people do what? Well, that's what they do during the work. What do they do afterwards? Take the credit. Now, what does that say? What does that say about those people and their view about that one person who's doing the work? What message are they sending? Value yeah. Well, they don't value them. They value their contribution, so they can take it and then say, well, "It was great to be in this group together. Talk to you next year." Um, but they don't value the person. That's that's what Aristotle's calling cataphrenesis, looking down at somebody. Um, spitefulness. Some people just like to screw with other people. He's got this great Greek word for this, eparasmos, you know. Um, we would call it malice. When somebody's malicious, they just enjoy hurting other people, causing them problems, but not actually getting anything out of it. They just, you know, they just are doing it to do it. And people do that sort of thing. Uh, if we use driving examples, what would be some examples? Of driving behavior that might fit into that. Tailgating. What's that? Somebody said cutting somebody off. Yeah. Just just for the sake of cutting them off. Merges are a bad thing for this. Driving super slow. <laughs> yeah. Speeding up while you're driving. Oh, yeah. I go. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. See, and there's there's an example where you could have like two people getting just furious with each other, right? Not that, 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 yeah. Yeah. Um, some of those are spitefulness. Now, then there's what he calls hubris. And you guys are probably familiar with this term in a different context. When we talk about somebody having hubris, we usually mean they're like, you know, thinking that they're the champion and, and the hubris goes before a fall. The Greeks meant much, something much wider than that. It could be walking up somebody and smacking them in the face. It could be saying bad things about them. Uh, usually had a sort of openness to it, and it was done basically to enjoy dominating the other person or enjoy hurting the other person. Uh, it's like cataphrenesis, except cataphrenesis is a little bit more low-key. Hubris is pretty, pretty severe stuff. You could actually prosecute somebody in some of the Greek courts for, for hubris, for the crime of hubris. Um, so Aristotle talks about these... these uh, Things is causing anger in us. Then he gives us these dynamics of, of anger. Um, one, of the, one of the ones that's the most interesting is that um, people get angry when another person prevents or hinders or even fails to help them with something that they want. So I was thinking as I was driving up here, um, if my wife had been in the car when I made the mistake and I was going the wrong way, um, and let's say she hadn't seen either. That could have led to, you know, one of these tense situations where I'm trying to figure out how, the, how am I going to get back onto the highway that I need to be on, and she's trying to give me advice, and I feel like it's not actually helping me, and now I start to get angry, stupidly. But that's something that happens with us quite often. Um, people think that they're being helpful for us, and it turns out that they're actually hindering us. We, we get angry. We often feel, find people getting angry at us when we try to help them. 
Can we have that happen as well? So that's one important dynamic. Another really interesting dynamic, Aristotle points out, he's a great psychologist, people get really angry when you make fun of something that they care about. It doesn't have to be a person. For the philosopher, he uses as an example. It could be philosophy. Philosophy is stupid. I don't know why anyone studies that sort of you know, nonsense. Philosophers often will get angry about that sort of thing. Um, or, you know, when, did, did you ever have them, like, your family confuse philosophy and psychology for a long time? You're studying psychology. Online, but it's not <laughs> yeah. 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 That can, you know, if people seem like they don't, they don't know what you're interested in. Um, they belittle it. Um, now, here's where it gets really interesting. Aristotle says people do get upset about that sort of stuff, but who gets the most upset about that? Who would you would guess? Like, let's say we're going to talk about, we'll just pick something out of the air. Um, anybody here a gearhead? You're into cars or trucks? You work on them? Okay. So what's, your, what's like your favorite model? BMW. Oh, yeah. BMW is stupid. I don't know why anyone would drive that. That German stuff <laughs> should be American-made. You, you've probably heard things like this, right? Yeah. At one time, or another. motorcycle people are terrible about that. You know, it's the Japanese versus the Americans versus the, the German manufacturers. Um, now, if you actually feel secure about your, you know, capacities as a mechanic, about your knowledge of it, you don't care if people want to smack like that, right? Because they don't know what they're talking about. But if you feel insecure and somebody's making fun of something that you identify with, that can really trigger an anger response. Aristotle writes about this at, at length because he's, he's observing this in other people. So who gets upset when you make fun of philosophy? People who aren't very good at it. Who gets upset when you talk about, you know, uh, make fun of cooking? It's not the chefs. It's the people who want to be chefs who, who get upset about that. This is a very useful model for anger, for understanding what goes on when we get angry. I, I also gave you another um, worksheet, and you notice it's got all these elements in it. I took Aristotle's thing, and you can see about how many, do all of you get angry? Any of you never get angry? Totally calm. You're, you never get angry? That would be a blissful life. That would be wonderful. So you probably can't fill this out then. But, but the rest of you, you can imagine somebody else. Somebody else getting angry. The rest of you can fill that out and think about, you know, ways and, and expressions of getting angry. Let's think now about actual virtues and vices. So we know we do get angry. We know that Aristotle says that virtues are in the middle position. Vices are on the extremes. Um, which extreme do you think most people tend to? Too much? Too little? In our society, you think it's too much? You think it's too little? Yeah. That it's too little. Okay, so what would be some examples of, of people that get angry too little? Yeah. You're going to say too much? Okay, well, we'll come back. I mean, Aristotle in his society, he's like, yeah, too much is clearly the winner here. Uh, but maybe in, maybe in our contemporary society, we have people who don't get angry enough. Yeah. Um, I was going to say people who internalize and confess their opinion. Yeah, now that's a really interesting one that Aristotle does talk about a bit. He actually locates that on the side of too much, in a way. The people who just hold on to their anger. He calls them the bitter, and we'll come to them in a moment. Yeah. I would kind of agree with that because if you can internalize it, you can never work through it and let it go. So it would be on to it. So then it's done inside too much. Yeah, and, and sometimes people get passive aggressive. Those are people that kind of correspond to what Aristotle calls the, the halapos. The, I could, you know, could literally translate it. No, it's not literally, it's figuratively. It's pains in the asses. The kind of people that are troublesome. Usually troublesome is how, how we translate that. Yeah. Also, I would say, adding on to that, people can't say no. Oh. Yeah. Now, there's other virtues and other vices that can be connected with that. But um, 
how would that fit in with anger? They don't get angry when they should. People are, are imposing on them. People are, and they just sort of take it. So Aristotle does talk about, about that. He, um, I gave you the, the last handout of all these handouts that I've given you. It's vices and virtues concerned with anger. I put it into a schema. I've actually done this with all of Aristotle's virtues and vices. Um, there's there's a, uh, a website I can, I can send you to if you, if you want that sort of stuff, if you're into that kind of thing. Um, he talks about people as being inerascible. That means they, they don't get angry when they should. And he also uses the term slavish. Andro, uh, andro, andropodotes is a long Greek word for that. Um, and he thinks that the people who are stuck in a one-down position often can't get angry. They can't express their anger. Here's a little, you know, this is not to his credit, doesn't really care about those people that much. He's more concerned with, with you know, certain strata of society. We don't have to go that route. We could say, well, there are some people who don't get to express their anger, and that's a bad thing for them, uh, because then they're stuck in this this other position where it starts to become second nature to suck it up, swallow it, to say, well, uh, like you were talking about people who don't say no, say, I guess I had it coming to me. I guess I'm that kind of person. It's okay to insult me and treat me badly. Uh, and, you know, their, their self-esteem goes further and further down. Um, Aristotle says that it, it's, it's a problem when people don't get angry when they ought to get angry and they accept insults and humiliating treatment. So here Aristotle would be at odds with um, quite a lot of other thinkers about anger. You know? um, because some people actually say, well, you know, you should be humble and let people do whatever, whatever they want to. Um, Aristotle would say, well, that's completely crazy. That's a vice. That becomes a bad habit that becomes part of who you are. And then when you realize it and you want to escape it, you, you have a very hard time getting away from it. Did you have another question or are you just stretching? I'm sorry. That's okay. I used, to, I used to do that all the time when I was in class. I'd stretch my arms like that. It must have confused my, my professors an awful lot. Um, what's that? Some of my, my professors would get really angry. I mean, things were quite different in our generation of, um, of uh, college and, and uh, K through 12 teachers. Um, I remember, this is a total digression, but it just brings to mind, when I was in sixth grade, we had, a, we had a drama class, and, you know, it was middle school, and so there were these kids coming from all over the place, and everybody had to do, like, a skit, you know, you practice your drama, and these, these kids that had all gone to the same school, they acted out this skit where, uh, and this was like an actual case, a teacher had slammed a student's head into a chalkboard, and severely hurt the student, and she went, to, she went to jail. She was taken out of the classroom, and, you know, rightly so. Um, and, you know, we were all like, what, what was that about? But it wasn't, you know, unimaginable for us, because things like that, you know, those sort of things happen quite a bit. Um, I think there's a lot better control over that sort of thing now, don't you? I hope so. <laughs> you hope so. I mean, not in some areas, I suppose. Um, but I still remember all the beatings. So. Did you get beaten? We got paddled. Yeah? Was, uh, in school, you mean? In the South. Uh, paddling was yeah. yeah. We, um... Yes. Yeah. We... The punishment was regarded spare the rod and spoil the child. We had that in middle school, but it wasn't with a paddle, thank God. Uh, and then it wasn't like that in high school. Um, but, yeah, I mean... Aristotle actually has another funny story. He talks about, this is a person who doesn't have proper proportion when it comes to anger. He talks about a guy who um, drags his dad by the scruff of his neck, because he's having a fight with his dad, out to the doorstep and then drops him there. And um, when people blame him for that, he says, well, that's how far he, he dragged his father when he got mad at his father. So I'm doing just what's allowed me, you know, I'm following an example, uh, I'm expressing my anger in the right way, because look, I mean, he, he thought it was okay to do that, so obviously it's okay to do it to him. And everyone else around him is like, you're, you're, you're not getting the point here. You know? um, but there, there are things like that. Let, let's look at the vicious dispositions, the excesses. Aristotle names a bunch of these. You know why? 
a lot of different ways we go wrong with anger, and they're, they're not all the same. Um, maybe some of you will identify, you know, people that you know or, or even yourself in these. The quick temper. They get, angrier, they get angry quicker than they want to with the wrong people, over the wrong things. The good thing about these people, we call them hotheads, they quit being angry pretty quickly. So you probably have some friends like that, right? They, or family members. They, they're easy to anger. They, they don't pay attention. Aristotle says that anger is like a hasty servant who hears half of the orders and then rushes off to go do the work. Uh, anger is like that in that it hears something and it says, I'm being insulted. Somebody is, you know, slighting me, and it may not actually be the case, and it goes off to the, you know, the, the emotion. Um, now, you know, people like that can be, be a problem, but you can sort of rein them in if you have the right, you know, institutional things. Much more worrisome, the rageful, uh, acro holoi, the acro, you know, high. Um, they get angry quickly, and they get angry over everything. These are the people who need anger management classes because it's gone so far that they get angry over everything. Anything can set them off. You know any people like that? Yeah. Um, there's some cartoon characters like that, too. Now, here it gets really interesting. The bitter temper, the picroi. That literally means bitter. That's the taste uh, that, you know, uh, in, in Greek, um, you know, that we associate with bitterness. Like when you... Uh, what would be a bitter thing to eat? Like almonds, beer is bitter. Um, now imagine that intensified. And now imagine that turned into an emotion. These are the people who get angry for a long time. Why? They keep their anger in. This is what we were talking about before. And they just nurse their anger. They're not satisfied until they actually get to uh, exact their, their revenge, their retaliation, even if it's imaginary. Um, until they get their, as we say, pound of flesh, they're not going to be satisfied. They may not appear angry, which is why they're dangerous. But they will, you know, be motivated by that emotion. Then we have the troublesome. They become troublesome more than they should and for a longer time, and they won't be reconciled without some sort of retribution or punishment um, of the other person. Not punishment of themselves, but punishment of the other person. And these are the kind of people that are just a pain in the rear. You know, you know, you know, people who are kind of sour, and they always seem to need to have something to be upset about. You know, any people like that? Because if that's part of their character, that's that's become a vice, and they're not. When when you point that out to those people, what do they respond? Aristotle doesn't talk about that, but we could go further. What do they usually say? Have any of you ever pointed that out to a person? You're kind of a kind of a sour puss, kind of a you know, kind of grumpy all the time. What's wrong with you? Why are you like that? Nice day. But, you know, these people that you keep complaining about, I don't see anything wrong with them. Yeah. And it doesn't feel, feel like they can, like, never catch a break or they feel like the world's out to get them. Yeah, so that's part of it. Um, you know, when we think about why people become angry, there, there is that sense that, like, the, the whole world is sliding. All, all of them. You get with that, that expression, all y'all, you know. All y'all are, are, are doing that. In the north, it'd be all used guys in the, the cities. Yeah. Um, so it, it seems like murky waters to me because on one end of the spectrum, you have the hothead yeah. who gets mad at everything, but his anger is quick to fade. And on the other end, you have the bitter person who nurses, nurses their anger and it changes who they are. Yeah. So where is Aristotle drawing this middle way? Like, Oh, we're getting to that. Okay. Um, these are all on the side of excess. Um, but they're different ways of being excessive. You know, this is one of those places where um, Aristotle's schema of there's always like one virtue, one virtue, one vice, one vice. There's actually a bunch of vices concerned with anger. And they, they look differently from each other. Um, well, let's, let's jump to that. There's, there's also the violent or abusive that he talks about. These are people who are just like, you know, you've got to watch out for them because they're always engaging in retaliation. These are the people who get in bar fights and kick people, you know, in the ribs when they're down. But those are the people you have to really watch out for. Um, the virtuous disposition. In Greek, it's called praotes. The, the good person in that respect is called praos. And when you are reading other literature, you may see it described as meek. For example, when you're reading um, biblical literature, uh, Moses is described as praos. Uh, the same word is also used 
in you know the Beatitudes, blessed are the meek, it's blessed are the, the prowess. Um, now, you know, Moses is kind of a tough guy. So he's not, it's not like he never lost his temper. Um, but the, the question is, what, what is this, this meekness? It's better to translate it as something like, you know, getting angry at the right time for the right reasons, with the right people, to the right degree. It's not a matter of not getting angry at all for Aristotle, this kind of meekness, or gentleness, or good-temperedness. He says this person gets angry at the right time, to the right degree, with the right people. There's all these rights in place. Now, is, that, is, is there a, a subjective element to that? Yes. It's, uh, it, will it be, in, to some degree, contingent on the societies that we're in? Probably. But that doesn't mean that we can't have some sort of outlines for what is productive anger um, and what is you know, uh, self-destructive or destructive of other people and our relationships with them sort of anger. And it could vary from place to place. So, for example, in my family, um, I come from a, a French-Canadian family, and um, when I was a kid, we yelled at each other a lot. We didn't, you know, you only got hit if you were being punished, and that was adults and, and kids primarily. But um, adults would routinely yell at each other. And I've been in, in um, other people's households where yelling was a sign that everything was going to fall apart. I have a friend who's, who's a, a, from a household like that. He would never imagine his parents or his brothers and sisters yelling at each other. It actually did happen, and when it did happen, it was pretty much like a family emergency. Now, those are expressions of anger, and there, there's a subjectivity to that, right? You know, is, can you draw hard and fast rules about how much can you yell? And that's not what Aristotle's talking about. He's talking about it being ruled by some sort of, you know, um, flexible standard, you might say, right reason. And that's going to be hard to adapt. Any of you ever read the book Emotional Intelligence? It starts out with a quote from Aristotle about anger, how anger is difficult to say. It's difficult to say who you should be angry with, how long, for, for because these things, you know, there's some play in them. But you can say, you know, you could, you could say to somebody, are you angry with this person for the right reason? That's something that you could ask somebody, something they could ask you, something you could ask yourself. If the answer is no, you're probably skewing towards one side or the other, right? Are you angry when you should be? There's another question you could ask yourself. Are you actually angry at the right person? If, if, I, if I get upset because of the signage... Uh, and let's say the designers were really at fault. How many of you from the, the region think they were at fault? Anybody? Very few. Okay. So, what's that? What was the question? Uh, there's, a, there's like a, a highway split. It was just sort of a local thing. Um, is the signage good enough so that somebody like me should be able to actually figure out whether to go on 87 or 90? Or do I get to blame them for... Get angry at them for putting the signs, you know, they should have marked it more clearly or something like that. That's a really stupid thing to get angry about. But if my wife is in the car and I turn and I snap at her, that's not virtuous anger, right? I'm, I'm angry with the wrong person in that case. This happens to us quite often. Um, he also talks about people like this as being disposed to forgive. So the person who's got a good disposition with respect to anger, probably not going to get very angry very often. When they get angry, it's going to be fairly reasonable. It's not going to be some, you know, rage that, you know, crests over and, and destroys everything. It's going to be fairly restrained, but they are going to feel angry. But they're also going to be the kind of person who is willing to say, oh, you know, you bumped into me, I'm not going to get angry over that. Or I did get angry a little bit, but I'll, for, I'll just, you know, I'll write it off. I'll accept your apology. Um, it won't be a, a big thing. Um, they may even be tempted to forgive other things. Aristotle doesn't think that forgiveness should be unconditional. He thinks that if somebody does something and they're doing it because they're a bad person, you don't forgive that. So he's a little bit different than some theorists when it comes to forgiveness. But he's willing to say that it's, it's pretty important. So does this give you... Yeah, go ahead. 
I understand the whole concept of positive anger and how it can be um, positively pursued, but can someone argue that there are other ways of resolving the problem than using anger and in oh, the sure. sense that anger cannot be positive? Well, yeah. You're saying that there could be a situation in which being angry and then acting on anger uh, might not lead to the best outcomes. Yeah. Aristotle would have no problem with that. But we are going to get angry. And he, he does think that anger does play an important role in um, you know, sort of making sure that people actually know that they're doing the wrong thing. Um, he's not saying that you, know, you want to be angry all the time. Um, but there is a legitimate scope for it. Um, where I wanted to go in particular with this is thinking about can anger be something that's useful, something that's needed in, say, protesting injustice? Did, did you have your hand up? Yeah. yeah. I was going to ask, how, if, you, if Aristotle is saying that you can't forgive, then how do you avoid this happening? Well, for, not forgiving and resentment aren't the same thing to begin with. Um, I mean, you just you can just think to yourself that person's a complete, you know, bastard, and I'm just going to dislike them. Well, yeah, I mean, not all not not all instances of not forgiving lead to resentment. Resentment is when you actually like nurse some sort of grudge against a person. I just like you know, I could have somebody who does something wrong to me. And they did it because they're, they're a bad person. I get angry at them. I act on it. I don't forgive them. And then after I've, you know, done something in, in response to them, hey, jackass, knock it off, I'm no longer angry because I've had my timorasis in that case. And I, I'm no longer resentful. Um, or I could, you know, um, go around and say that person's a bad person. That's not yet resentment. Resentment is, is you know, something a bit more... Uh, more seated, you could say, a bit more developed. Um, it's important to have like a, a bunch of gradations of these, these emotions because our emotional life is, is complicated. But let's go back to that question then. Is there, is there a possibility, given this sort of account of anger, for using anger, say, for doing activism or for calling people's attention to things that are wrong? Yeah. I would say no because um, it is control. It, it can be controlled if it's only one person doing it. They can have a group of people being angry at one single yeah. idea. It's they're not only being angry at it, but they're also being angry differently, which causes a lot of different complexity where it's really hard for it to be controlled. Yeah, that, that's true. You can't you can't predict like everyone's going to be virtuous. Yeah. I definitely see where you're coming from, but I think it can also be the time where everyone's angry and like united by that anger, and it doesn't have to be a bad anger because you can have good anger towards a positive situation. So you can channel that anger and like make a change or something along those lines. You can think of it as emotional raw material, which then flows into these habits. So you know, I, I, I'm very attuned to what what you're thinking of. With let's say I. There's a cause that I really believe in. Somebody's doing something wrong to somebody. I want to call people's attention to it. I frame my argument in such a way as to arouse anger because I'm you know, good at, at rhetoric or something like that. Um, that emotion can be very useful as a raw material to get things done. There may be some people who are in my audience who are vicious with respect to anger, like the person who gets angry over everything. And now I'm, I'm not directly responsible, but, but I bear some responsibility for the anger that they feel, which then they take out on all their coworkers because they read my internet article, or something like that. Uh, yeah. Um, I, I understand that you can be responsible, but each person... To some, to some extent. Yeah, to some teammates. Okay, actually, no. I'm not wholly responsible. They can't. They can't like say that's all Dr. Sandler's fault if I hadn't read that article because <laughs> they because they're the one who's vicious, right? They have the disposition. Um, you know, the last thing I, I guess I would say too is Aristotle thinks we have control, not directly, but control over our virtues and vices. We decide the kind of people that we're going to be, and so we bear some responsibility. If I have anger problems, 
Um, you know, it could be because my dad was an angry person and everybody around me yelled a lot. And, you know, we had, you know, all sorts of crazy stuff going on when we were kids. But at a certain point, I actually have to stop up and say, yeah, I, I, I need to, like, decide whether I want to be on this end of the spectrum or over here or in the middle because I'm the one who has to decide. Yeah. Say again? Into other things? You have a genetic disposition to anger. Oh, um. Yeah, you just mentioned, oh, my dad was, was an person. Yeah, I wasn't thinking genetically. I'm actually adopted. Um, yeah, it shouldn't be an Well, right. That's what I was saying. Oh, okay. I'm saying we are, Aristotle's saying we are responsible by the time that we're adults for our virtues and vices. And if we want to quit being vicious, we actually have to do quite a bit of work to, to wean ourselves away from it. If we happen to wind up virtuous, good for us. That's pretty rare. Most of the time we have to work at it in order to make it happen. So thanks for your uh, time and attention. And